King of the Dinosaurs then, with uh, the most famous time King of the Yo. So Zach will uh, give a talk on uh, the familiarity of Yosuke being very well in the Dark Nature and the same very well in the Cosmo. Great, thank you. Let me just uh, link up with the recording. Right, so I apologize, the title is actually two titles, um, but I'll try to in general say shorter sentences than this. So I will be talking about the baryon dark matter relative velocity, which I'll, ex I'll explain what that is quite soon, and then also a new approach to the three-point correlation function of galaxies, and these two things are related. So if you come away with nothing else from this talk, hopefully you'll at least come away believing that the end here is justified. So first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Sita and Dunlop for hosting me. It's great to be here. I've had some very nice conversations with people over the last couple of days. And there's uh, really exciting science going on. And I think it'll actually be obvious how some of the things I talk about could be used to bring that science forward. So we all know that the BAO are a standard ruler. Basically, you have these two degree hot and cold spots on the cosmic microwave background at redshift roughly 1,100. And they define a characteristic scale, which is actually set by the oscillations of the plasma before the CMB forms during the first 300,000 years of the universe. And so that's sort of cartoonishly illustrated by this little ruler here. Now, the reason you have these hot and cold spots is actually due to density perturbations um, at that time. So this is photons, but the photons are reflecting the density structure at that time. And today, the galaxies are tracers of the density structure. So this is just one of the typical um, pi diagrams where you're seeing redshift and um, the large scale structure as a function of redshift. And so this is redshift on order zero. And basically what happens is that this characteristic two degree angular scale due to the BAO actually also imprints on the redshift roughly zero galaxies. And so by comparing the redshift zero galaxies clustering to the CMB, we actually get to measure the expansion of the universe in the intervening time. And you can also do differential measurements where you look at different redshift slices, and that gives you actually you know, different points on that expansion history curve. The CMB is actually important because it gives you an absolute normalization to that curve because the CMB is just incredibly well measured, and we know, you know what the real scale of these is. So as I said, the BAO method today uses a bump in the two-point correlation function of galaxies. So the two-point correlation function just measures the excess probability if you're sitting on a galaxy of seeing another galaxy at a given separation from it, s. So here we're working in h inverse megaparsecs, and the BAO scale is 100. So here we've multiplied it by the separation squared. That's basically to make this little bump more obvious. The bump is actually about a 1% effect. And these three lines are just showing you the different Sloan Digital Sky Survey data releases, DR9 in red, DR10, DR11. And I think the only takeaway there is that the black guy's error bars are much smaller than the red guy's and the blue guy's, which means we're doing better. And in fact, the latest um, Sloan measurement, I think, has done roughly a 1% distance to redshift 0.57. So it's a really exciting achievement. And as we push to larger cosmological volumes, and more precise uh, spectroscopy and also a larger number of objects, I think that will only get better. And indeed, uh, DESI, which is one of the next efforts in this uh, spectroscopy line, is expected to achieve actually a tenth of a uh, percent precision, and that's on the next five-year time scale. So the original detection of the BAO bump in the two-point function was by uh, Eisenstein et al. in 2005 with another concomitant uh, detection in 2D FGRS by Cole et al. also in 2005. And this figure is from uh, the most recent, uh, probably not even the most recent paper anymore. But anyway, Anderson 2014. So the BAO are basically these oscillations in the plasma. And let's start with this picture, and then we'll move to this picture. So this picture is basically showing you if I set up a homogeneous universe with a single Dirac delta function over density at redshift infinity, what happens at later times? So here we're about redshift 1440, so just before recombination. And what I want you to focus on is this red and blue curve. This is showing the gas, or the baryons, and the photons. And you can see they're doing the same thing. And that's because the universe is ionized, and Thomson scattering couples the photons to the electrons, and the electrons pull the protons along by Coulomb forces. So basically, you have essentially this waterbed where the water is a baryon photon fluid. You can think of the single overdensity that I'm suggesting you set up here as just a person jumping on that bed in one spot, and it sets in motion these acoustic waves. And what happens is 
it initially causes things to infall via gravity. That creates an overpressure. And then that overpressure shoots out a wave of baryon and, baryons and photons. And that's what you're seeing here. You're seeing this um, pulse traveling outwards. And this is just a snapshot in time. So this wave front is actually moving out at roughly one third the speed of light. And um, you can see it hasn't quite gotten to the BAO scale of 150 megaparsecs yet, where it will halt when the universe becomes neutral and the photons release the baryons and uh, different physics starts to take place. So the key thing to really see here is that if you're a baryon and you're within the sound horizon, you actually don't get to infall onto an overdensity because the photons are pushing you out much, much faster. And indeed, the reason this uh, baryon photon curve is flat is because the pressure in the photon fluid actually just dominates any gravity. And so it's really just about hydrostatic equilibrium, but the pressure is really dominating, which basically flattens out any structure that the original overdensity at the origin might create. And indeed, this little peak here is actually due to the initial overdensity at the origin, so that is entering. So now, if you look at the velocity structure, so this is the density, but if we now look at the velocity structure, the velocity structure reflects what I just said. Basically, this red curve is showing you the baryon velocity. And inside the sound horizon, which is denoted by this red line at RS, sorry, maybe a little hard to see a red pointer against a red line, but this red line is the sound horizon. Um, basically, within the sound horizon, the baryons are just at rest. They don't get to move at all. The photon pressure is locking them in place. Now, there is a little bump here at the sound horizon. And that's because that's where this um, wave front right here is continuing to move outwards. But basically, the story with the baryons is that they're at rest inside the sound horizon. Meanwhile, outside the sound horizon, the pressure just hasn't reached them yet from this initial overdensity. So outside the sound horizon, the baryons actually don't know about anything but gravity. So they're infalling just as 1 over r squared. Now here we've multiplied this plot by r squared, so that looks like a flat constant. But I think the key takeaway here is that outside the sound horizon, both baryons and photons are just responding to gravity, so they actually have to do the same thing. Their velocities are exactly the same here. Now let's look at the dark matter, the CDM in blue. Outside the sound horizon, as I said, it's just infalling as 1 on r squared. Inside, it's still infalling. That's uh, why this velocity is negative. Can everyone see the laser pointer, by the way? Yeah, maybe, maybe I'll move to the stick. Um, yeah, so inside the sound horizon, the velocity of the dark matter is still negative, so it's infalling, but it's not infalling exactly as 1 on r squared. It looks more like a 1 on r infall, which would give you a line if you multiply by r squared. And that's basically because this pulse of baryons and photons moving outwards changes the gravitational forcing that the dark matter feels. And if I'm a dark matter particle sitting over here, I see a lot of this pulse outside of my Gaussian sphere. So I'm actually receiving less gravitational force than a guy sitting out here is, because the guy sitting out here sees this whole thing inside the Gaussian sphere. So unfortunately, I won't have a lot of time to talk about the details of this today, but that's the basic picture. And you know, feel free to chat about that with me afterwards. So this <coughs> fact that the baryons and dark matter do different things creates a relative velocity between the two, shown by this black curve. This black curve is literally just taking the red curve minus the blue curve, which just flips the blue curve up and adds a little bump to it. And so you can see that the baryons in dark matter are really doing different things in velocity, but only within the sound horizon. Basically, they start to agree pretty much entirely outside the sound horizon. And this is smooth because there's a little bit of diffusion damping as the baryons don't perfectly couple the photons. So, this relative velocity, it does stop being sourced at recombination, because at recombination, the baryons become neutral, they decouple, and they can also just infall under gravity. So it's damped as 1 over a, where a is the scale factor. But even at redshift 50, the relative velocity is roughly 10% of small halo's circular velocity, say a 10 to the 6 solar mass halo at redshift 50. This would be 10% um, of that guy's um, typical circular velocity. So these small halos are luminous red galaxies progenitors, in particular the luminous red galaxies today that we use for the BAO method. So if the LRGs today have a strong memory, then the relative velocity could introduce additional correlations on the BAO scale and potentially bias the two-point function, and I'll show you why. So this idea that the relative velocity can be important for the late-time galaxies we use to measure the BAO motivates us to consider this galaxy bias model. So what is a bias model? A bias model is just a way of connecting the matter density field, which is the fundamental quantity that we put through the equations, to the thing that we observe. 
the galaxy density field. That's basically all the matter that shines and we can detect. And so it's basically a Taylor series. You basically say that at, at lowest order, the galaxies just trace the matter with some bias, B1. If it were one, then you just have galaxies exactly tracing the matter. If it's bigger than one, which it usually is, that means there's some preference for higher. Um, well, anyways, it, it, it can be whatever it wants. We fit for it. Then you have this second order term, which just says that the uh, galaxies also trace the square of the matter density. And one is subtracting this just to make the mean value of the galaxies zero, because we think that's what it is. And then now we're adding in this relative velocity bias term where BV is an unknown parameter that basically hides a lot of physics. It basically parameterizes our ignorance of how the very early time small halos that we think are affected by the relative velocity map to the late time galaxies that we actually measure. And then this V squared BC is just the relative velocity squared in a particular region of the sky. And we just divide out its standard deviation to um, work in dimensionless units. So this bias model is originally you, uh, due to JLU, Neil Dalal, and Eros uh, Seljak. And I believe all of them probably have some CETA connection. So just um, interesting work that people from CETA continue to do. And using that bias model, we can just go ahead and compute the two-point correlation function of galaxies. And in particular, what we want to compute is what change to that function does adding that relative velocity bias actually induce? So here I'm just showing you if we let the velocity bias be 1%. In reality, we don't know this number. We want to measure it. So this is just an example. And basically, what this is showing you is that the relative velocity term changes the correlation function, but primarily inside the sound horizon. This sound horizon is still marked in red. It is doing a little bit here. It's actually also subtracting from it outside the sound horizon. And what this can actually do, if you go and look at the correlation function, which is just in this inset, is it's basically moving this half of the plot up or down. And it's also moving this part down a little bit because of this subtraction here. And so you can see if I shift only this left half up, and if I shift this right half down a little bit, that'll actually change where the maximum of this bump is, which will mean I change where I plot this red line. This red line is, of course, the sound horizon today, which is what I use to measure the cosmic distance scale. So basically, because of the compact support of this effect, which is due to the compact structure of the relative velocity, and by compact, I mean it only has support roughly out to the sound horizon. Because of that, you actually end up being able to shift where the BAO scale and the two-point correlation function occurs. And so of course, if you don't model that, when you go and calculate the cosmic expansion rate from the two-point function, you'll get the wrong answer. And you'll infer the wrong equation of state for dark energy and think maybe you've measured you know, a non-cosmological constant when the answer is cosmological constant. Or you might fail to detect you know, a non-constant dark energy and think it really is a cosmological constant, depending on how big and which direction the error goes. So we'd like a way to protect ourselves from that, because that would be really bad. This is, again, a systematic offset in the BAO scale. So it's not statistical. It's not about doing more galaxy surveys or larger numbers. It's really about the modeling being correct. So the idea here is to use the three-point correlation function of galaxies to actually extract the relative velocity bias and then use that to correct the two-point if we need to. So the three-point function is literally just taking a triplet of galaxies, one at s, one at s plus r1, and one at s plus r2, and asking what is the excess probability of finding a given triplet of galaxies. And so this expectation value basically mods out the translation and rotation invariance that we think is there. In other words, in cosmology, we assume homogeneity and isotropy. We think things look the same from any place in the universe, and we think if you move, and we think if we look around ourselves, things look the same in every direction. So basically, if you do that, that actually integrates over this S. That just corresponds to moving the origin of the triangle. And it also integrates out some of the degrees of freedom in this R1 and R2. That corresponds to rotating the triangle about a given point. So you get down to this three-point function zeta, which just depends on the two triangle side lengths and the opening angle of the triangle. This is really just high school geometry. You know, triangle has side, angle, side, or side, 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 or angle, side, angle. And here we've just chosen side, angle, side. So now we just use this bias model plug it into here and do the computation. And it turns out that the three-point function has a term in the linear bias cubed, the uh, uh, nonlinear bias, B2. And it also has a term in BV, 
And this BV term is the aspect of that that will be important to us because that's what allows us to measure it from the three-point function. So I now want to describe this multipole basis that we're going to introduce for the three-point function. This will turn out to be very nice for the relative velocity me measurement, but moreover, it'll actually have extremely enabling properties um, for measuring the three-point function very quickly, which I will talk about as well. So this is just the idea that any function of two sides in an angle, you can expand into radial coefficients that only depend on the side lengths, r1 and r2, <coughs> and Legendre polynomials, pl, that just depend on this opening angle. In particular, they depend on the cosine of it. So here I've just listed them, just so you are reminded of them, know that they're not really scary objects. They're basically just polynomials in cosine theta. P0 is 1, P1 is just the dipole cosine theta, and P2 is this thing. And the thing to note is that this L always tells you the maximum power of cosine theta that enters. So if you see L equals 4, think it has a cosine theta of fourth, it has a cosine theta squared. And the hierarchy is always you go down by steps of even or odd. So all the odd ones only have odd powers, all the even ones only have even. That actually won't be too important, but just as orientation. So one more thing before we get to look at the theoretical predictions. The squeeze limit of the three-point function is particularly dangerous for perturbation theory. And schematically, it just looks like this. Basically, you have two sides that are almost the same length and a small opening angle so that the third triangle side gets small. Now, you should be imagining a galaxy down here, a galaxy up here, and a galaxy over here. And so if these two galaxies are getting really close to each other, they're interacting very strongly gravitationally. They may actually even be inside the same cluster. So you just don't expect linear perturbation theory to model them accurately. So we really want to avoid this squeeze limit for linear perturbation theory to give us a good model. And in practice, we think that starts to happen when you go below any side being about 20 or 30 megaparsecs. And um, I'll actually be showing you an even more conservative lower cut, I think, of 75 megaparsecs for the smallest triangle side. So that's just one um, sort of aspect of this that one should keep in mind. So now I'm showing you what these multipole coefficients of the three-point function actually look like in theory. So each of these panels in L is showing you the multipoles. Here I'm focusing on the multipoles of the terms in B1 cubed that enter. Later we'll open up these columns and see what the other terms look like. And we've actually suppressed the diagonal of this plot to avoid the squeeze limit because on the diagonal of this plot, so it's showing you the two side lengths, R1 and R2. So on the diagonal, R1 and R2 are always equal to each other. You have an isosceles triangle. And when you have an isosceles triangle, you can close it and make the third side go to 0. And that actually, that configuration turns out to dominate the diagonal. But we don't think we can model that, so we just decided not to show it. And so the thing to note here is that there are some features at the BAO scale here. Basically, it looks like the three-point function has a slight excess of triangles in red over random, and then a slight decrement of triangles in red, uh, blue as you cross the BAO scale. So that'll come back into the talk later. But for now, let's look at the other terms that enter the three-point function. So these are the terms that enter proportional to the nonlinear bias, B2. These are the terms we're really interested in today that enter proportional to the velocity bias, BV. And the key takeaway from this plot is really just you can add this column times some amplitude plus this column times amplitude and make it look like this column times some amplitude. In other words, even if you got the values of linear and nonlinear bias completely wrong, it still wouldn't look like the relative velocity bias. So if you see something that looks like this in the three-point function, you can be pretty confident that it actually is the relative velocity entering. And in particular, you can see the relative velocity really likes triangles that have two sides just within the BAO scale. That gives you it an excess of them in red. And it also doesn't like triangles that have one side within and one side without the BAO scale. And if you remember back to that plot of the velocity structure itself, you can kind of get a feel for why. The velocity is really adding correlation information below the BAO scale. And it's zero outside the BAO scale, which I think is why this uh, decrement occurs. So we actually are particularly interested in this L equals 1 multipole because it has the strongest signature. But you can see that the other multipoles also have information. And in the end, we'd like to use all of them. So I now want to talk about this compression scheme we've invented to further deal with the squeezed limit. Basically, as I said, you want to avoid this limit where two galaxies get close to each other because perturbation theory breaks down. Ideally, you'd also like to get down from two-dimensional color plots to 1D line plots, because then you can show error bars and actually look by eye and see you know, is the fitting we're doing sensible. It'll also reduce the dimension of the covariance matrix, which 
will enable computing it faster and exploring more models and just generally sort of keep the dimension of the problem more tractable. So what we've decided to do is actually say that we'll fix one of the triangle sides and then we'll force the second triangle side to live in an annulus given by say one third of that first triangle side to two thirds of it. And this is showing you in physical space what that does. These three dots are meant to be galaxies. And basically the point is you can see this guy can never get close to this guy and we've fixed this guy and if we just set some minimum on this guy that'll achieve that this side is never too small and because of this annulus's outer boundary this guy can never get too close to this guy so this compression scheme if you choose your fraction of the first side that you let the second side be right and if you choose a minimum on the first side it actually gets you away from the squeezed limit and you can just always be avoiding that so mathematically, the compression is just the integral of the full three-point function's multiple coefficient weighted by the usual spherical volume element just from uh, these two bounds on the um, uh, first side. So just integrating over this gray annulus. And then graphically on these color plots, what it corresponds to doing is you just sit at a fixed um, R1 and you integrate up along these slices in R2. And this wedge is bounded by the lines uh, two-thirds R1 and one-thirds R1. And in practice, we may choose you know, different ones. This is just for an illustration. So you're integrating out the second triangle side. And so now this compression has just been applied to that L equals one relative velocity plot. So we just take this guy and we compress it in the way I just described. And the curves to focus on here are the uh, turquoise one and the purple one. So the turquoise one is the total um, compressed three-point dipole with no relative velocity, and the purple curve is the total with the relative velocity, and we've used a bias of only 1%, which is well within the allowed observational constraints on that bias at present. And you can actually see that there's a really quite significant effect where roughly at the BAO scale, the relative velocity, even if it only couples in at a 1% level, can change this compression by 20 to 30%. So I think it's fair to say, if you were only using dipole information, which you're not, you're using all the multiples, but if you were only using dipole information and if you can get about 5% error bars on the three-point correlation function, then you should be able to place a four to four and a half sigma constraint on the relative velocity if it's a 1% amplitude. So you can you know, then say, oh, if I decrease that by a factor of 10, you can translate that into what constraint you could place. But I think this is at a level that's actually already probably interesting in SDSS and um, certainly going to be worth doing for DESI. So now I've presented to you why we want to measure the three-point correlation function. We want to do it to protect the two-point function from a possible systematic bias. But it turns out measuring the three-point function is actually not so easy. And that will be the next part of the talk. So if you want to measure these multiple coefficients, you're basically talking about doing these, this integral. You sit on a given density point given by S, the origin, and denoted by this red X. You choose two other density points around it at distances R1 and R2 and angles R1 hat and R2 hat. And this S is just denoting they're around that point. And then you just project that onto the Legendre polynomial giving you this weight, which requires the relative angle. So to do this integral, it sure looks like you need to look at pairs R1 hat dot R2 hat, because after all, this is a relative angle. So you need to look at this pair. So it seems like for each red X you sit on, you need to do something that scales as n squared. You need to look at these pairs. And now you need to sit on every one of these galaxies in the survey and do this. So it looks like you have to do an n cubed calculation. Now, DR12 has about a million galaxies in it. The work I'll show you in a bit uses 800,000 of those. An n cubed scaling is just not a favorable scaling for that kind of work. I mean, people do do pair counts for the two-point correlation function. It already consumes some sort of non-negligible amount of computational time but then scaling that up by another factor of the number of galaxies is just really, really bad. I mean, it's not as bad as a factor of a million because you do have some maximum scale that you measure the correlations out to, which reduces it to say 6% of a million. But still, you would like to not be doing it this way if you want to you know, run analysis variations, actually run your algorithm on mock catalogs and you know, be able to really explore what can be done with the three point. So we need a way to basically manipulate this integral into something that doesn't require a triplet count. So it turns out there's a secret sauce which lets you do just that. It's existed since the 1870s. It took me 
quite a long time to realize it was there, but once I did it really transformed the problem. And what it is, it's the spherical harmonic addition theorem, and it basically tells you how to go from this, which requires this relative angle, to a separated product of spherical harmonics, each of which only depends on one of these angles. So these YLM are just the normal spherical harmonics. They enter in various contexts in quantum mechanics. And here you're actually just summing out over these spins m from negative l to positive l to get back to this uh, Legendre polynomial. And so if you now take this addition theorem and just insert it in place of the Legendre polynomial, it immediately just splits these into two integrals. And these two integrals actually have the same form. You can see that up to the dummy variable, they're actually the same integral. And so just showing you the same equation that was the last line of that slide, but focusing in on this part, Basically, this integral is just the ALM coefficient of the galaxy density field around a given point s. So because the galaxies are discrete, this delta reduces the integral to this sum. And it literally is just the sum over all the galaxies j in a given bin of radius r evaluated at the angular coordinates of those galaxies. So these ALMs are the fundamental quantity you want to compute. So now I apologize for the equations. Those were the hardest slides in the talk. Let's now look at a picture that's going to make this much easier to understand. Basically, what the math on the previous three slides is telling you you should do is around each galaxy, you compute the ALM in spherical shells or radial bins. So you sit on this x. You bin up all the galaxies around the x, the x being the central galaxy. You bin up all the galaxies around it into these spherical shells. You compute the ALM expansion on each spherical shell, and now, when you want to do a three-point function, you can be comparing on a bin-by-bin bin basis rather than a galaxy-by-galaxy galaxy basis. And if you only use 10 to 20 bins, which is the typical number one would use, that just totally is negligible compared to other aspects of the calculation. So this expansion on each shell is still order n about each galaxy. And you still have to do it for every galaxy. But basically, this is now an n-squared algorithm for the three-point function. So we coded it up. It's 500 times faster than the naive triplet counting procedure that I first outlined to set up the problem. And it's actually only six times slower than computing a two-point correlation function. And in fact, a lot of the time is spent finding the galaxies around a given galaxy within a sphere of, say, 200 megaparsecs. And you can calculate the two-point function at the same time as you do this three-point function. So really, probably, if you were obsessed with speed, you would just want to run the two computations at once. And then this, six, this factor of 6 would probably amortize further because you also get the two-point. So now that we have a way to measure the multipoles, the question is, how do we fit parameters to the multipoles? Well, you need the covariance matrix. That turned out to be hard. The previous state of the art on that, due to Istvan Zaputi in 2001, required a six-dimensional integral. And that wasn't in the multipole basis, and it just was not clear how to project that onto multipoles. I'm not sure if you can. So I basically went back to the drawing board, thought about it actually for about two months, and managed to calculate it. And this is the answer. And basically, what you do is you go into Fourier space. Then you have a linked nine-dimensional integral over closed triangles of wave vectors, and that they have to close due to translation invariance. But that makes the problem very nasty, because having the condition that the three wave vectors close couples them all, so you don't get to separate integrals. So it ends up seeming like you have a linked nine-dimensional integral that you then have to transform back to real space if you want to apply it to a real space measurement like the three-point function. So that's not good. But it turns out that using techniques originally developed for nuclear physics relating to addition of spins and angular momenta, you can factor this all into products of two-dimensional integrals, which I just list down here, that are basically just transforms of the power spectrum. So this is entering here with um, one free triangle side, and this guy's entering here with two free triangle sides, r1 and r1 prime. So this is complicated math. This is just a picture to show you we really calculated something. But in the end, this new prescription allows us to do the whole sort of set of integrations in about um, an hour or two hours. This plot, which is just some bins of the covariance, was calculated in about 10 minutes. So this has really made the covariance much faster to evaluate and actually more or less tractable. So we'd now like to test the covariance because we did make two assumptions on the previous slide. I assumed that the covariance is dominated by the Gaussian random field term and that there are no survey boundaries. And in reality, we know that the large scale structure isn't entirely a Gaussian random field today, and we know there are survey boundaries that matter. So you'd like to test the analytic thing on the previous slide against something more realistic. 
So what we do is we just take the analytic thing denoted by GRF for Gaussian random field, and we apply its inverse to a covariance <coughs> matrix formed by um, just computing the three-point function for 300 mock catalogs, the patchy mocks for uh, DR12. And the reason to do that instead of just using the covariance from the mocks is that when you try to determine a 100 by 100 matrix from 300 mock catalogs, you have more matrix elements than you have mocks. So each matrix element will be very noisy and probably the matrix isn't invertible. So you want to avoid inverting the mock matrix, but you need to invert the matrix to actually do parameter fitting. So you can use the non-inverted, just the mock covariance to test your analytic guy, and then you can invert the analytic guy when you actually fit parameters. So here what you're seeing is just this thing, and the reason we do a half inverse on each side is just to keep it symmetric. And then we have subtracted the identity matrix. So if our analytic covariance is perfectly matching the mock covariance, you should actually get the identity matrix out of this, and then when you subtract the identity matrix, you should get zero. And I've windowed out the top half just so you don't spuriously see structure. But basically, this in the bottom half does and should look like noise. The mean of the noise is about 0.6%. You'd like the mean to be as close to zero as you can get. And the root mean square is about 6%, which is exactly what you expect if you determine 110 matrix elements from 299 mocks. It just scales as the number of degrees of freedom over the square root. So this plot actually makes us believe that the Gaussian random field calculation we've done is sufficient to describe the covariance. So now let's actually look at results done with this. So I'll first show you mock catalogs so you get a feel for what we'll be seeing, and then I'll move to the data. And just to remind you, what I'll be showing you is these compressed results where we've integrated out one of the triangle sides. So you'll actually be seeing one-dimensional plots that have been produced by doing this integral of the uh, full three-point function. So this is the compressed three-point function multipoles for the mean of 299 DR12 mocks. So this is, again, the zero multipole, which is just um, the, the no angle dependence term. This is the um, first multipole, which is just the cosine theta angle dependence, and similarly for L equals 2, 3, and 4. And again, this axis is just the triangle side that we left free, the R1, and that controls how much of the second triangle side enters each of these points. We've also multiplied this by R1 to the fourth power. That's similar to multiplying the two-point correlation function by the separation squared um, earlier. And so these blue points are the redshift space mocks, and these red points are the perturbation theory model. And what's remarkable is that the model, even though it doesn't even include redshift space distortions, it's just this simple linear and nonlinear biasing that I showed you a number of slides back, it actually fits the mocks really extremely well. In detail, the chi-squared per degree of freedom is not one, it's actually three, which shows you that one can actually tell that there are additional modeling things we should probably incorporate if you had 300 times the volume of uh, SDS SDR12, which in reality we don't. But I want to draw your attention to some features here, in particular this feature in the L equals one. Now we're working in a megaparsecs per H again, so in this unit the BAO scale is 100. So right around 100 you see that there's a peak here and then a trough here. And if you think back to that plot I showed you of the L equals one linear bias, I highlighted that there was actually an excess of triangles slightly within the BAO scale and a decrement slightly outside of it for that multipole, even without considering the relative velocity. So this peak and trough is actually coming from integrating that. And the physical picture behind this is that in perturbation theory, the L equals one multipole is actually generated by gradients of the density field. And the gradients of the density field actually act as basically a high-pass filter, so they filter out any broadband behavior, because after all, a broadband shape doesn't have a big slope. So taking those gradients really focuses in on something like a sharp peak, which is what the BAO feature actually is. And it basically just gets you that sharp feature because it's a gradient. It's just sensitive to differences, or equivalently, it just upweights by a power of k and thus acts as a high-pass filter. So that's actually why this BAO feature looks sort of a fractionally of water unity here because it's um, really upweighted by that gradient. So these are the zero to four multipoles. I now wanna just show you the L equals five to nine multipoles just to show you that you can actually keep going and the theory doesn't break down and you still get agreement and you still get information because you can see there's a BAO bump here, there's a BAO bump here, and there might be a little bit going on regarding the BAO there. It's perhaps hard to see. So. I've showed you what we could do if we had something 300 times the volume of SDSS. Now let's look at what we actually did with SDSS. 
This is the exact same plot, but just now made with real data. We used roughly 800,000 luminous red galaxies from SDSS DR12, the CMAS sample. And these error bars here are the diagonal of the covariance matrix, but the parameter fitting was done using the full covariance matrix. So there is you know, some of this that's not being shown here, which is that the error bars are somewhat correlated. Um, but you can see basically that there is still a BAO feature appearing reasonably clearly in L equals one. And I'll get into the significance of that in a moment. And I just want to quickly show you the L equals five to nine ones to again show that by and large, the model's fitting fairly well. There are some issues here. I think some of this is due to covariance of the error bars. Some of it's probably just due to the fact that these higher multipoles tend to have a little bit lower signal to noise. So the noise is entering more strongly. Um, so now just to focus in on the BAO, basically what can do, what, 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 what what one can do is fit a no-wiggle power spectrum, which has the BAO removed from it, to the data, calculate the chi-squared for that, and compare that with the chi-squared for the physical power spectrum that does have the BAO. And here I'm just showing the L equals one because that's the visually most, um, most appealing. So if we were using the mean of the mocks, we would get a 56 sigma detection of the BAO in the three-point function. And so this is the fit with the BAO. This is the fit with no BAO. And you can see that it just doesn't get it right around the BAO scale. Now with the data, we obviously have 300 times less volume. So we get a 2.8 sigma detection of the BAO. And again, this is with the BAO. This is without the BAO. And you can see that this one looks more wrong. So I now want to quickly move to what we're looking at doing next, which is what about fitting the full triangles instead of doing this compression scheme where we integrate out a side? And there's a good reason to think that that would actually be beneficial in terms of detecting the BAO. And that's because. On this plot, the BAO feature we saw so far is due to this big red increment in triangles and then this blue decrement. And if you integrate across that, you can see you would get a peak and then a trough in the L equals one. But actually, this diagonal slash is also due to the BAO. And it happens because if you have the third triangle side, which is not shown on this plot, exactly equal to the BAO scale, then when the other two guys add to that scale, um, there's really information in the correlations. And so basically what you have is these flattened triangles where the two sides you do see in this plot are adding so that the third side can be exactly the BAO scale. And so of course, when you have R1 plus R2 equals a constant, that gives you a line in this space and the line is going from the BAO scale here to the BAO scale here. And so the key point here is that this feature is at smaller physical separations than this feature in general. And so we would expect the um, error bars to also get smaller in this region of the plot. But now if you do an integral over a wedge here, you're kind of smearing out this um, diagonal line that you'd like to measure. So it, it's pretty clearly not optimal to be doing this integration if you really also want to capture the probably higher signal to noise on the BAO that's in this slash. So we've been exploring basically fitting the full triangles without integrating um, out one of the sides. But to do that, it is important to understand the redshift space distortions, something that I already alluded to. Um, it turns out that in the compressed basis that I showed you where we had integrated out the triangle side, the models fit well without doing anything about the redshift space distortions. But we'd like to understand why that's true and whether that will break down when we now move to fitting full triangles. So this is just showing you the first kind of intuition that we got about that. This is mock catalogs from the DR7, the last Damas mock, ca mock catalogs produced by Cameron McBride and uh, his collaborators. And basically what we've done here is I've just taken all of these compressions given by these Ls and taken the redshift space and real space result as a function of R1 and just divided them. And the key takeaway from this panel is really that Basically, for most of the multipoles, especially these lower multipoles, which are in the solid colors, the redshift space seems to just renormalize the multipole by some constant that's roughly 1.7. And you can see that that constant isn't actually changing a whole lot from multipole to multipole. And it's not changing a lot with scale. Now, obviously, there is something more than that going on with these higher multipoles. These higher multipoles are still more sensitive to squeezed configurations, which the RSD, I think, also tend to produce because you know the fingers of God, if you look at a finger of God, it is a squeezed triangle effectively. So you know, it's, it's not completely obvious that we can just get away with a constant rescaling, but it's an interesting thing to start exploring. And I'll show you more information on that. <laughs> 
So this, this panel is just showing you this panel, but averaged over a scale. So instead of a scale dependent rescaling at each multipole, we now just report one number at each multipole. And this is showing you that basically the first five or six multipoles all kind of rescale the three-point function by roughly 1.7 when you introduce redshift space distortions. As I said, there's a bit more going on with the higher multiples because they're more sensitive to the squeezed configurations. So we'd now like to understand this that we're seeing from the simulation. We'd like to understand it from a theoretical perspective. So we begin with this bispectrum model. The bispectrum is just the Fourier space analog of the three-point function. And basically, this bispectrum model is just saying, you have two power spectra, two galaxy power spectra, and then you multiply them by these kernels, and all of these d factors go to unity or go to zero in the presence of no RSD. So these d factors are really encoding the redshift space distortions. So if you have no RSD, you still get this F2 kernel, which is just from a second order density field, but this G2 kernel, which is a velocity kernel, will just drop out because this guy goes to zero and these other redshift space distortion guys will also go to zero. So we need to understand what is it that the Ds are doing to the three-point function that makes it a basically, that makes them basically just rescale it in a way that's tractable. So unfortunately, each of these D functions is rather complicated. These equations are all in a paper by uh, Roman Scochimaro, uh, Couchman, and Freeman from 1998. And this is just one example. And you can see, basically, it has considerable dependence on the lengths of the wave vectors in Fourier space, k1 and k2. It also cares about x, which is the cosine of the opening angle between them. And what's even worse, it cares about k3, which is this side. And the thing that's really bad about the k3 is that if it only cared about k1, k2, and x, some of the math that I've already showed you can actually be used to write the inverse Fourier transform of this in a separable way that involves simple one-dimensional integrals against the power spectrum and is very computationally tractable. But it looks like now that we have a K3, K3 is really the vector addition of K1 plus K2. As, as you can see, it's a triangle rule. So it seems that if we want to take the inverse Fourier transform of this model and get to a three-point function model with RSD, we really need to be doing a coupled six-dimensional inverse integral over all of the K1 and all of the K2. To, to deal with this K3. So that's not good because you know, you could do it with the Monte Carlo technique, but then you worry about convergence. It's not computationally efficient, and it would just be uh, nice if there was a better way to do that. So I found a way to do that. Basically, it turns out that using some of the same math tricks that I explored before, you can actually reduce this inverse Fourier transform to products of one-dimensional Hankel transforms of the power spectrum with small additional terms involving a 2D transform. So let's look at that. This is just the L equals 0 and L equals 1 terms with RSD. And so first, if you look at the limit when beta goes to 0, beta being the RSD factor, which is just the growth rate over the linear bias, when beta goes to 0, you can see that all of this stuff drops off, and you just get back to 34 firsts times these functions, which it, it turns out is the limit you expect if you just look at the no RSD uh, three-point function. And uh, similar conclusion holds for this L equals 1. So these, these guys, C1 and C2, this is just shorthand for a linear correlation function evaluated at R1 and evaluated at R2. So this is something we know how to deal with. It's just the inverse Fourier transform of the power spectrum, one dimensional integral, all good. These guys are basically the same thing, but just weighted by an additional power of k. That's actually entering because this L equals one term is sensitive to gradients, which as I said, bring down a power of k and therefore upweight the power spectrum by that. And in fact, that's why they have these interesting order unity BAO features. So these guys, we really know how to compute. We were computing them anyways for our three-point modeling with no RSD. They're given by these formulas where p is the power spectrum and these are spherical Bessel functions. And this is the upweighting by the power of k I mentioned that enters here. But these small corrections given by kappa, they're the guys that really are encoding this K3 dependence, and those were actually the guys that were really hard to compute. It turns out they don't matter at all. They're about 1%, but we didn't know that going in, and so I figured out how to compute them, and that's how we now know that. So this is just the formula for them. It's a bit intense. Basically, it involves these three I functions, which are defined here, and they're basically these, these 2D integrals of the power spectrum against spherical Bessel functions. So you have these tensors that you form where you have this power spectrum and the spherical Bessel functions, and then you integrate two of those against each other to get to here, and then you add those up to get to the correction. And the reason this correction is small 
is that these coefficients actually add up to zero, and these functions are just not all that different from each other. So you're basically adding three things that are nearly trying to cancel out. And um, physically, I don't think we fully yet understand why that is, but that's an aspect of this we're still trying to explore. So I'll now just wrap up by showing you what we get out of that. This is the multiples of the redshift space three-point function. If you can remember back to the real space, no RSD plots I showed you of the three-point function before, you should be feeling, wow, this looks similar, because it does. It's basically just multiplied by the same number, by a constant throughout all these panels. And to zoom in on that conclusion a little bit more, what I did is I took this plot and divided it by the model with no redshift space distortions and asked what is the ratio. And so these are just the L equals 0, 1, 2, and 3 plots showing you that ratio. And now these look like they have crazy structure, but that's actually because you're getting a divide by 0 in regions where the no RSD three-point function is getting small. But most of the story is actually about the fact that these plots are really mostly the same color, which tells you that they're basically roughly constant. These plots also allow you to see why our compression scheme was making this even more tractable. Because remember, our compression scheme actually takes a wedge over here and integrates over it. And when you do that, you're basically reducing the impact of any regions where it's not just a constant rescaling because they get averaged out. Um, and so just to wrap up, I've shown you a fast novel algorithm to measure the multipole moments of the three-point function. We've used it on 800,000 uh, DR12 LRGs from SDSS. The modeling seems to fit well, and we have a 2.8 sigma BAO signal in the compressed basis. And this work is on the archive if you're interested in um, further details. And where we started is that all this is useful for isolating the relative velocity as a possible source of bias in the two-point function and controlling that possible systematic in the distance scale. And that's where I'm hoping to go in the next couple of months to actually measure the full three-point function, fit for this velocity bias, and see if it could be impacting the two-point. And right now, what's underway is incorporating the redshift space distortions to analyze the full uncompressed um, three-point function. And the goal there is also to detect the BAO at even higher significance than 2.8 sigma. I believe from preliminary analyses that I've run that we can get to between 4 and 5 sigma. And once you get there, that's actually at an interesting level where you can measure the cosmic distance scale from the three-point function alone to roughly 1.5% precision. So that's kind of an unexpected aspect of this, that it turns out there really is distance scale information in the three-point function. And it's not going to reach the same precision as the two-point function, where they've already reached 1%. But it is an interesting complementary source of information that I think we should really be exploiting, given that the data you need to do this is exactly the same data you could use for the two-point function. Like, the surveys are being done anyways. The spectroscopy is all there. So why not just be a little smarter with our analysis, run some fast algorithms, and you know, extract all the distance information that we can find. So, thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. I think it depends on the type of process. I mean, most of the processes that happen don't involve gravity in the sense that most things like feedback, like if you worry about supernova feedback or if you worry about chemical enrichment affecting the star formation and that's somehow coupling in, that's all basically well, fairly like local. Yeah, that's true. I mean, things like that could matter, but unless the mean free path is sort of larger than 150 megaparsecs, then it's really hard for it to actually, because basically you should imagine the universe is a patchwork quilt where you have blue squares and red squares, and the blue squares and red squares are both 150 megaparsecs on a side, and actually you should imagine uh, circles, but that wouldn't tessellate the quilt. So imagine squares, and basically if you're a galaxy sitting in a square, all the other galaxies sitting in that square will care about the same relative velocity value that you do. 
And so anything even like Lyman Werner, unless it can actually get out of that square and get into some other galaxy square, it I don't think can introduce correlations. Um, what I do wonder now that you ask this is if um, non-local bias in like the tidal tensor could actually matter because that is a gravitational effect. So that actually can get pretty far. And you know, it might be that there's some coupling between the tidal tensor and the relative velocity that kind of does, as you say, effect, modify the effective shape of the Green's function. That would be interesting to do some estimates on. My suspicion is it wouldn't matter a lot because I think that the tidal tensor bias is roughly on the order of the nonlinear bias, B2, which we did measure and which we found we basically got it that it wasn't zero, but we had like an error bar that was comparable to the measurement we made. So it's just not very well constrained, which tells you that the model isn't that sensitive to it. So I would suspect, given that I think the tidal tensor bias is also on the order of that effect, that whatever it, even if it did couple to the relative velocity, it would be at a higher order in the, sort of a higher order in the expansion than the relative velocity term ent enters at. But um, yeah, I, I think it, it would be worth doing more quantitative work on that. Have you thought at all about the interplay with um, nonlinear PAO reconstruction? Yeah, actually, just yesterday, um, Joe Bovey and I were talking, and he pointed out that since we know the velocity greens function now, you could probably just feed that into the whole reconstruction algorithm and just tell the reconstruction algorithm, look, you know the density field, compute for me not only the velocity field you were already computing to do the reconstruction, but also compute the relative velocity field and then do some prescription based on that to kind of know out the effect. The problem though, I think with that, or at least the thing we still need to answer about that is what prescription do you then put in? Like if you say, okay, in this patch of the universe, I know what the relative velocity is. After all, it's just sourced by these densities and I can compute it. How do you then decide, oh, I should reduce the amplitude of my galaxy field after reconstruction by you know X percent? I think that would in the end come down to still knowing that biasing um, amplitude BV, so you still kind of need some way to measure that. So I think if we find an interesting value of that with the three-point function, it's definitely worth then exploring. Given the knowledge of that number, could we feed it into a reconstruction to just take it out of the two-point rather than just fitting a two-point model where we know that number? So yeah, great question. Sure. How correlated is the measurement of the PAO to the three-point function to the two-point function? Yeah, that's also a great question. Yeah, that's a great question, and we just don't know the answer. I mean, analytically, you can look at the covariance and construct it, and it's uh, sixth order in the linear density field. But I don't know that that tells you much, because the three-point function is fourth order, and the two-point function is second order at leading order. So they're also, you know, you would the covariance kind of has to be sixth order. People, up until say about 2005 or six, were just ignoring it. Then there was a calculation in 2006 by uh, I think Sefusadi and Komatsu that basically says that the covariance between the two-point and three-point is extremely sensitive, is dominated by the squeezed triangles. Um, but they did it in Fourier space, and squeezed triangles in Fourier space aren't actually necessarily squeezed in real space because a squeezed triangle, you know, it has all the information about multiples of that frequency. But if we just kind of take that as an intuition, I'm a little optimistic here that since we're avoiding squeezed triangles, we might be avoiding the most dominant part of the covariance and actually getting independent information. But uh, that being said, I think the way to answer this question is to really ask, what is the observable? The observable is just the BAO scale. Let's just go and measure the BAO scale in the two-point function and in the three-point function and just make, a, two -dim just make a, a plot, a scatter plot of that and see, okay, do all those measurements fall along the line, in which case you conclude that the three-point is basically telling you what the two-point already told you? Or is there kind of elliptical scatter in the way that you'd expect if they're independent? And we have the 300 MOP catalogs. We have the three-point measurement from them. Other people have already done the two-point measurement of the distance scale from them. So all we really have to do is fit for the distance scale from the three-point and make that plot, and then we have an answer. Yeah. 